shall we? Sure. All right, so I will start by welcoming the professor and Niklas and welcoming everyone here uh, to the third edition of the COVID Flash Talks titled Fear and Loathing in Times of COVID-19. My name is Tamoy Fuji, and I am a master's student in global governance and diplomacy at the Oxford Department of International Development, ODID. And I will moderate today's talk together with Maurice Kirschbaum, who is an MSc student in migration studies, always at ODID. COVID Flash Talks is a new initiative supported by ODID, which aims to create a space in which academic debate can be started around the current COVID-19 pandemic with reference to the issues dealt inside the department. In the first 25 minutes of today's talk, our two guests will present their research. Therefore, uh, thereafter, we will have time for Q&A, concluding event, the event at around 2.50 p.m. Participants will be able to submit questions at any point of the talk through the Q&A function that you all should see below the Q&A function. But first, let me introduce you to our guests. Professor Friedrichs is Associate Professor at ODID, where he teaches, among others, the course in Global Governance. And his passion for research has brought him to navigate many issues from climate change to transnational crime and terrorism to international relations theory. In another timeline without a pandemic, he would have been roaming the streets of Birmingham and Halifax in Yorkshire to interview locals and to investigate relations between Muslims and non-Muslims. However, since the end of Hillary term, he hasn't been able to remain inactive and has started this new research that he will present to us today. Joining us from Berlin is Niklas Steyr, who now works at the IBM AI core team and will soon join ETH Zürich for a PhD in machine learning. He was presented to me by Professor Friedrichs as a tech savvy guy, which I presume it has to be true based on the fact that he has researched artificial intelligence in among others, UCL, Tsinghua University in Beijing and Oxford at the Department of Computer Science, next to Unibox. Now, I know the usual ODID crowd does not have much to do with computer engineers, but Niklas here is actually very interested in highly interdisciplinary themes like conflict networks, online media bias, and the AI-driven governance. And more on that later, probably, Niklas. But now I will not persist further. So Professor Friedrichs, the floor is yours. Thank you. So we'll get to fear and loathing in the times of COVID-19 uh, after a presentation of the theory, the concepts, the hypotheses, and the cases selected, and COVID-19 will be one. Um, populism is an emotional form of politics venting anger against established elites seen as betraying the people uh, in favor of other groups such as ethnic and religious minorities, the rich, etc., you name them, could be fake media. Uh, this is in line with authoritative definitions of populism, for example, by Kars Mudde. To the extent that populism disrupts elitism, these would be the polar opposites, and enfranchises large groups, it should be welcome despite its negative aspects. So here we are slightly in disagreement with much of the scholarship that has a censorious slant when it comes to populism. Established elites understandably fear populism, but it does perform important functions for democracy, increasing participation and facilitating representation of a demographic that is or feels uh, disenfranchised. Just see how I can, yeah. Um, so, at a minimum, uh, we need a better analytical understanding of the ways by which populist actors challenge elitism, as well as the ways by which governmental actors, populist actors, governmental actors, 
inoculate themselves against such challenges. The first response of governmental actors is often to ignore or dismiss uh, populist anger, uh, thereby partly validating it, uh, because that's the point of the populists, they don't listen. And um, when the strategy does not work, their second response is another form of emotional politics, relying on fear to discourage people from supporting populism. You'll see what happens if you vote for Brexit or if you vote for Trump. Uh, governmental actors also rely on fear for other reasons, um, but with the same effect, namely disempowering populism. In a contest for the hearts and minds of the people, populist actors therefore react as viscerally to governmental politics of fear as governmental actors react to populist politics of anger. This dance of fear and anger, or what we call the fear-anger cycle, is worth exploring not only on conceptual and theoretical terms, but also empirically. Accordingly, our aim is to thoroughly theorize the fear-anger cycle and test it in three concrete manifestations, Brexit, Trump, and COVID-19. And this little model that you have at the bottom right of the slide uh, encapsulates uh, the theory. So I'll start with the concepts, fear versus anger. Anger is the key negative emotion populists activate and amplify. When fear takes hold, however, People follow established leaders, as we are now seeing, uh, rather than expressing dissent. Like other forms of anti-establishment mobilization, populism thrives on anger but loses its sting in a climate of fear, whether that fear is based on real threats or created by governmental actors. Following Plutchik, fear is a response to danger. It is a negative emotion triggered by real or perceived threats, either inhibiting action or mandating escape into some form of safety. Fear suggests that there is no alternative to the status quo or some risk averse policies, such as, for example, the UK remaining in the European Union or social distancing and lockdown in times of COVID-19. Anger, on the other hand, is another negative emotion it is response to enemy. The trigger is a real or perceived obstacle posed by that enemy. Anger then invites disruptive action to tackle the enemy and remove the obstacle. It thus appeals to people who refuse to accept that there is no alternative, whether that is Brexit or in COVID-19. Accordingly, angry people tend to perceive fearful people as misguided and part of the problem or as an obstacle, and that's associated with enemy. Um, in times of serious political stress, fear appeals to governmental actors because it preserves the status quo and or allows them to present counter threat policies as without alternative. Insisting that there must be an alternative, populist actors just look at people like Trump now, how they behave, they respond with anger against out of touch governmental actors, even when they are in office. Um, and any other groups, Bolsonaro, and any other groups seen in a symbiotic relationship with such actors. So media, for example, a fake media. Uh, unlike public intellectuals like uh, Michael Moore and academic scholars like Martha Nussbaum, we do not see populist animosity against minority groups as a credible manifestation of fear. Uh, populist fear is mostly theatrical. Uh, for example, xenophobes are not really phobic. They are angry people. They are not really afraid of the foreigners, uh, whatever, smashing their windows. They're angry about their presence in, in our view. So now I'll, I'll develop uh, from these concepts, I'll develop the theory. Governmental uh, actors, slide forward. Governmental actors shape uh, subjects in ways that entrench centralized power and related knowledge systems, thereby advancing the pursuit of policy objectives. That's basically Foucault. Uh, one of the ways they do this is by transforming issues of normal politics into security issues. Weaver, Buzan, and others here. Uh, and in extremis, declaring a state of emergency, 
Agamben. Populist actors may have their own authoritarian propensities, but at least as long as they are not themselves in power and authority, they mobilize anger against governmental actors. In a battle for the hearts and minds of citizens or in a battle for the public sphere, uh, governmental and populist actors send fear and anger signals respectively first to the public sphere and then by the public sphere, citizens pick them up and tilt one way or another in lending support to either uh, governmental actors or populists. And you have the graphical depiction of that uh, on the slide. So governmental actors pursue various strategies to shape subjects in the pursuit of policy objectives. One strategy is to raise fear in the public or real of real or could also be constructed threats and to transform these into security issues. The reward is greater support from citizens. Populists, on the other hand, present governmental actors as harming or betraying the majority. The aim is to arouse anger among the people against governmental actors and perceived allies they may have. Targets include not only the elites, but also ethnic and religious minorities, foreigners, wonks, fake journalists, you name them. Anger may then, uh, if it's successful, uh, spur citizens towards disruptive action, such as, for example, supporting populist parties. To counter this threat, governmental actors become even more wedded to fomenting a climate of fear, suggesting that there is no alternative to whatever the preferred state of affairs or the preferred policies are um, to the status quo and risk averse policies. To the extent that elites and their allies manage to convince the public that fear is justified, citizens become less receptive to anger signals and less supportive of populist actors. The propagation of fear thus has the intended or unintended effect of containing populism. And this uh, leads uh, to the following general hypotheses in terms of observable implications, but also testable um, um, propositions. Hypothesis number one, governmental actors predominantly send fear signals and one can look at texts and see whether this is the case. Uh, populist actors predominantly send anger signals. Once again, one can look at texts and see if this is the case. Number three, in the public sphere, there is a negative correlation between receptiveness for fear signals on the one hand and anger signals on the other. So we would expect at times where fear uh, predominates, we would expect to see less anger and vice versa. Um, hypothesis number four, greater receptiveness for fear translates into more support for governmental actors. Greater receptiveness for anger, by contrast, translates into more support for populist actors. And this you can then measure in various ways, but in principle, it should be observable and one can see whether one finds it confirmed or disconfirmed. So uh, I now come to the case studies and the case specific hypotheses. So these four should uh, cut across uh, the, the cases to be studied. Um, so in this study, we shall examine three case studies to test the theory and find out more about fear anger cycles. A cycle may begin with fear as in the case of COVID-19, but a cycle may also start with anger as in the cases of Brexit and Trump. These are two um, scenarios, and uh, there are case-specific hypotheses uh, that are different for either scenario, so I'll present them separately. Um, first, uh, Brexit and Trump. Uh, in 20, 2016, populist anger carried the day in the UK Brexit referendum. Uh, in my humble view, it was a sort of neck to neck race between anger and fear and, and, and anger won by a couple of percent. Uh, as the campaign progressed, London based governmental elites increasingly relied on what the populists called Project Fear uh, to sway the vote. Uh, the playbook resembled the 2014 Scottish independence referendum when London had warned Scottish voters to be careful what you wish for. 
In 2014, the strategy worked, albeit by a small margin. And in 2016, it backfired again by a small margin. Too many angry voters saw project fear as a ploy. In the same year, Donald Trump was voted in as US president on a wave of populist rage. As in the UK Brexit referendum, US governmental elites were spreading fear about what would happen if populism carried the day. Even though the strategy did not deter enough citizens, governmental actors have continued with it. They depict President Trump as a threat, for example, for democracy or global free trade to attract greater support from citizens. Populists depict this as an outrageous witch hunt, uh, which is a term dear to President Trump and, and his supporters. In both cases, the cycle started with populist actors fomenting anger, followed by governmental actors spreading fear of what might happen if populism had its way. Such politics of fear may work temporarily and among part of the citizenry, but populist actors may also expose it as a ploy and thereby fuel further outrage. The politics of anger calls forth the politics of fear and vice versa. And you see the, the, psych, the cyclical element of this or how one, uh, one begets the other. So populist actors mobilize anger. For example, this could be Eurocrats, Washington, liberals, migrants, et cetera. To the extent that this succeeds, citizens become more supportive of populist actors. As an antidote, governmental actors mobilize fear of the negative consequences of such anger. Uh, you'll see what, what happens if uh, Brexit uh, carries the day. And to the extent that this succeeds, citizens become more supportive of governmental actors. And we, I, I think this temporarily does occur. Um, but as a counter move, populist actors expose fear mongering as a manipulative and damaging, or both, uh, either or and, or both. Uh, and to the extent that they are successful with this, then citizens become again more supportive of populist actors. So in these specific cases, Brexit and Trump, the theory has the following uh, observable implications. 5A, populist actors send anger signals. This resonates with mainstream media, although decreasingly as the cycle progresses. Yet it ultimately translates into majority support for populists. So a dip in uh, the, the fear strategy leads to a temporary sort of maybe some, some volatility, but in the end, as the Bre Brexit day, uh, day uh, the, the referendum day comes or the, the presidential vote comes, uh, um, an uptick. Um, and 5B, as the cycle progresses, governmental actors send fear signals. This resonates uh, with mainstream media, but ultimately fails to translate into majority support for governmental actors. Of course, we know the public responses. The interesting bit and the theory testing bit is looking at whether the transmission went through these signals and then media and then resonance with uh, citizens. So that's uh, what we hope to trace. Um, and now, finally, to fear and loathing in times of COVID-19. Uh, the coronavirus situation offers a unique opportunity to test our intuition of a cycle connecting the predominantly governmental politics of fear with the predominantly populist politics of anger. As the crisis unfolds, we expect a swoosh shape, like the swoosh, um, relation, a moderate dip in populism in the first few months of the crisis, followed by a significant hike afterwards. Variation in terms of fear and fear-driven policies is likely to explain different trajectories over time and across countries, be that Germany, UK, or United States. Subsequent to the outbreak of COVID-19, fear is rampant. This is what we've already seen. Uh, it is partly due to real danger, but it also has the effect, intentional or unintentional, um, of buttressing the executive at the expense of others, including populists. And we've seen this. Uh, populists have gone down in approval rates, at least temporarily, and may now be coming back. Uh, where populists are in office, notably in the United States, and that's an interesting special case, um, but also, for example, in Brazil, they persist with anger and are less keen on spreading fear. 
uh, fully in line with what the model predicts. Uh, elsewhere, we expect a populist comeback. Once fear-driven policies have generated sufficient dislocation in terms of recession of the economy, job losses, mental health crisis, et cetera, et cetera, the politics of anger will be back with a vengeance. So in the specific case of COVID-19, the theory has the following observable implications. 6A, governmental actors send fear signals. This resonates with mainstream media and translates into more support for governmental actors, but it eventually loses effectiveness. And 6B, populist actors send anger signals. This resonates with mainstream media and translates into more support for populist actors as the lockdown progresses and generates dislocation. So after a time lag, significant time lag, but eventually, maybe a couple of months, three months, it will vary um, by parameters, we'll see. So now my final comment is just on case selection. Uh, while the cases of Trump and Brexit are naturally about United States and United Kingdom respectively, in the case of COVID-19, we will focus on Germany. Thereby, we pursue a diverse case design. Uh, people in GGD will recognize this. Uh, so we look at uh, two different uh, types of cycle in two different periods and regarding three different themes. Diverse case scenario to explore interesting variation. In the case of COVID-19, we examine the United States and the United Kingdom in addition to Germany. So we look at three cases. Um, uh, we thereby hold period and theme constant while exploring variation related to disease outbreak and government response. And here the United States with a populist in office is going to be an interesting special case. So that's how far um, we've got with the framework and the theory and the case selection and the concepts. And I would say my greatest success thus far has been, and it's been, uh, I've, I've been working hard to find a, a suitable person because I'm a qualitative scholar. I teach uh, qualitative research methods. Uh, so somebody um, who has the tech savvy uh, to actually uh, you know, get to the bottom of this and find out whether I'm right or wrong or indeed whether we are right uh, or, or wrong. And after se uh, several failed attempts, people are busy. And of course, in times of COVID-19, all the, um, you know, the, the, the tech community, they're very sought after. I was very, very fortunate uh, to, uh, to, come, uh, to um, come across Nicholas, who is now going to tell us uh, how uh, to operationalize this in terms of, um, in terms of theory testing. Sorry to interrupt. We are ready after your your presentation to move to the technical tech savvy side with Nicholas. Uh, just a reminder to the attendees to keep uh, questions coming. I see already a question here, but uh, if you can post them in the Q&A section, please, so that uh, we will have them all together. OK. Thank you, Professor. Nicholas, the floor is yours. Just share my screen as well. So first of all, thank you very much again for the really kind introduction uh, from Tamoy, Maurice and Lur to present today our joint research. And thank you also, Jörg, for the really kind handover. <laughs> um, so I'm really happy to um, present to you more of the, I'd say, data-driven considerations of the study. And since I know that this is quite a broad audience from interdisciplinary different fields, I'm going to keep this uh, more to a high level and uh, try to line out the general procedure that we're going to follow in order to get to the bottom of these uh, hypotheses. And um, so the way I'm going to do this is by presenting you two previous works that I have contributed to, uh, both carried out in Oxford as well. One is on um, the core risk index. And the other uh, was on a news uh, paper analysis. And uh, I'm gonna do or draw parallels to the study uh, that I um, carry out together with Jörg on populism and the fear anger cycle. 
And for each of the works, we're going to follow the same approach. So first, we're going to think of how do we retrieve the data? So how are we going to get to this newspaper data? Uh, then how do we uh, detect the entities? In our case, this would be how do we detect newspapers uh, concerned with, or newspaper articles ra rather, concerned with uh, COVID-19, Brexit, Trump. And finally, the third step always, how do we then carry out the sentiment or emotion analysis? In this case, it's gonna be emotion analysis on fear and anger. So this first work, um, was uh, done quite recently together with um, researchers from the SAIT Business School and the Oxford Internet Institute and also from Hertie School in Berlin. Uh, we called it the Korisk Index and kind of the idea behind this research was to um, provide policymakers uh, from early on with an additional economic measure um, to, to make, yeah, to build their, their, their policy making on basically. We have the stock data, we have the unemployment rates, but uh, can, is there something more that we as data-driven people can, pro can, can provide? And we therefore um, turn to this 10K filings from the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, the 10K filings are kind of a risk report that each company in the United States with a, a revenue more than 10 million um, more, more of 10 million has to um, issue once a year. And um, these, these 10K filings are quite nicely structured, which will help in the case of data-driven research because we know which section to turn to. And also they are quite uh, helpful in the case of COVID-19 because um, all the companies are basically incentivized uh, to give a, a good statement because if they underestimate the risk due to COVID-19, then maybe the risk that later on insurances or uh, state funds may not, may, may not jump in and cover, but if they overestimate the risk, they may have a problem of shareholders bailing out, etc. So we look at this risk section of each report, identify the term uh, coronavirus or COVID-19, and then related other terms. And we did this uh, starting in early March already, and um, yeah, do it. Uh, we, we crawl, we crawl these 10K reports every day and do this kind of analysis. And the insights from this um, have been quite interesting so far that we here see indeed that starting in February, the reports mentioning the COVID-19 crisis is uh, rising steadily with the small dip uh, in March. Uh, but overall, uh, it is more and more anticipated, and now almost 100% of all reports are claiming COVID-19 as a uh, risk to their, to, their, to their business. And even more interesting, we did the sentiment analysis on the uh, risk reports, and also on the left side, you see the negativity. So how negative are they about the, the COVID-19 crisis? And they are increasingly negative. Uh, and this negativity on the left side even predates the stock index. So basically, uh, by looking at this uh, economic measure or this negative uh, sentiment, we can anticipate up to seven days in advance uh, slight drops in the, in the real stock movement. And um, in, in our study uh, on the fear anchor cycles, we're also going to do a similar kind of uh, sentiment analysis and going to look, for, for instance, the left side would be also the sentiment of fear and anger and the, the lot on the right side would be the support of voters uh, for uh, populist versus uh, governmental players, for instance. And um, this Korsk index um, can be viewed using these two uh, QR codes. You may simply scan them. Um, and I would just like to shortly show you this dashboard that we created, um, just shown here. So basically we, we, we built this interactive tool. Oh no, actually it disconnected. Let me just quickly reload. There you go. So we have, we have built the Korosk index um, and you can select the different time range. You can select the different industries and then basically uh, see how, how different um, industries uh, anticipate the risk. 
We have the text sentiment provided here. And also what I didn't show yet is also some kind of topic modeling. So here you can see that for instance, the manufacturing industry uh, anticipates the biggest risk uh, uh, it, or the biggest bottlenecks in their production, for instance, and not in the financing of projects, et cetera. Yeah, as said, we have been quite happy on how, um, how uh, well of a, um, yeah, feedback we got for this Corisk index. Uh, we got featured by the Washington Post and um, different uh, forums. Let me jump back uh, and go to the, to the second study. Uh, so this is on, this is the first one was on COVID-19 and the second one is on looking at newspapers, which is also gonna be relevant with regards to, to our planned study. And uh, on the sentiment political compass, which we presented also at the Oxford Internet Institute, we measured the proximity between newspapers and political parties. So basically we usually only have this vague opinion of how close is a newspaper to a political parties. Uh, the Guardian may be more left-wing sort of say, or in the German or in the US landscape, Breitbart. Yeah, we all have these notions uh, where they belong. Um, but what we, what we did here is, as we are gonna do in, in our plan study, we're gonna crawl, or we, we did crawl the articles from newspapers over two years of time. We then did some kind of entity tagging or sentiment analysis. So in this case, we identified um, this kind of article is talking about the conservative party with Angela Merkel. Um, and in our study, we can identify, is this article talking about Brexit, COVID-19 or Trump? And then lastly, uh, did some kind of analysis on these findings. And um, this is quite an interesting a plot, uh, more of a static one. So over the course of uh, one year, um, on the x-axis, you see all the newspapers and on the y-axis, you see all the parties and the colors indicate their conviction or their, 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 their precision towards them, just uh, purely on data-driven uh, perspective. And you, you see some things that are expected that for instance, the newspaper affiliated with the Green Party is more positive towards the Green Party, but also you, you find quite some surprising uh, things. And um, this is also some kind of a groundwork to our study where we expect or we somehow associate, uh, as mentioned, for instance, Breitbart as more a supporter of the populists or um, certain newspapers as more of the mainstream centered newspapers. So uh, this may be quite helpful as a groundwork. And uh, uh, the last plot that I'd like to show you with that regard is we would also, as mentioned earlier, uh, are gonna relate um, the sentiment in the newspapers, so fear and anger, to real world events and to the support. And this is also something we did here. So what you see is the sentiment towards the different political parties um, over time. And then also we have tagged some real world events. So for instance, let, let me just pick out one, um, the G20 summit. Uh, in Hamburg uh, back then, uh, which uh, we, where we observed uh, quite some violent protests. And back then the left, uh, the left party in Germany, the Linke, um, they were accused of not properly separating themselves from these protesters. And so we, we found this dip uh, of sentiment throughout all the newspapers basically. And yeah, in our study, we also hope to relate sentiment of fear and anger of these different newspapers with the real world events. Um, yeah, and, and um, validate the, the hypotheses. This brings me to my last slide to end up. So what we've seen in both cases is a three-step approach of data retrieval, entity event detection, and then sentiment analysis. Um, the data retrieval step is in the next uh, couple of months, uh, we're gonna invest a lot of time and effort in crawling newspapers to get a good coverage. Uh, there are some paid options where you can buy or get the newspapers from archives, but also uh, trying to crawl them with uh, own code uh, through Google News APIs. Um, yeah, they're different open source um, frameworks. Then we're gonna relate the newspaper articles to, or yeah, affiliate them with the entities, Trump, Brexit, COVID-19, and then finally do emotion analysis on these articles. So they're pre-trained emotion classifiers uh, so that we don't have to label the articles ourselves. They have been trained on 
Twitter data, but also newspaper data. There are different options um, on the on the table, and yeah, this is so. This is our perspective on the data-driven ideas, and we hope to see you again in a, in a few months with our results. Then, thank you. Wow. Uh